You're listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is Season 1, Episode 1, Carrie. I'm your host, Haley Radke. Today we'll be talking to Carrie, a fellow adoptee, who will be sharing her reunion journey with us. You'll hear her allude to how she flooded an entire family with postcards in an attempt to find her birth mother. We'll wrap up with some recommended resources for adoptees in reunion. Well, I'm so pleased to welcome Carrie to the show. She's a fellow adoptee, and um, I'm really excited to hear your story today, Carrie. You've got lots of interesting perspectives to share with us, so welcome. Thank you, Haley. So I'd love for you to start with maybe telling us a about when you were born and your relinquishment story, anything that you know about that would be awesome. I was born in 1970 in Vancouver, BC, and was adopted by Americans who um, were living there, working abroad, although they were all blood family. I have two older brothers that were both um, blood children of my parents. Um, They were having trouble conceiving and particularly a girl child my mom wanted a little baby girl and um this was in the era of close adoption still and so they went to the catholic adoption agency in vancouver and (laughs) put in for a (laughs) a little white baby (laughs) and were matched with me actually before my mother would have um carried to term her her final like sixth or eighth um, miscarriage, very tragic start for them. So I came into a family that had all kind of stuff, but were really um, excited to welcome a little girl. And I might have been what you would have called sort of a poster child adoptee my whole life growing up. Um, I was one of those kids where they sort of said, you know, um, being adopted is special and being adopted it means you were chosen. And I bought that. I mean, I, I really bought into it and um, felt really proud about being chosen and special and um, sort of sang the praises for adoption my whole life up until just about <laughs> reunion, which happened um, with my birth father in 2008. Um, and in between, there's sort of a, a long story, but I just, I guess I just wanted to start off my story by saying I, adoption has always um, been just sort of background noise. I never really felt overly compelled to search or felt uncomfortable not knowing. I always felt really kind of grateful just for the chance to be here and sort of had this weird sense in the back of my mind that I could have not been here. It might have been a choice to have um, been terminated, so... Not not to make it political, but I just had always sort of colored my view. I was just going to say I'm 45, almost 46 now, and um, I sort of hinted that my relationship with my adoptee status started to get a um, lot less <laughs> simple when reunion happened, and you know, you t- you hear a lot about the reunion roller coaster. If you have at all considered searching and reuniting, um, it's one of the first things you'll read about. If you if you search, and thank goodness there is stuff online because I'd heard about it, but I will say I was <laughs> nonetheless unprepared because I I thought I was so okay with being adopted. What issues could I possibly have? I don't feel angry, but and and adult me wasn't angry, but it turns out that infant me was. <laughs> <laughs> had a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> um, so, so in between, I guess I will just um, fast forward my story a little. I left Canada with my U.S. family when I was six. Grew up in California, and sort of lost um, touch with my Canadian identity and self and history and schooling. Um, but didn't seem to mind. My family were, my parents were transplants from Chicago into California, so none of us really fit, and no one really cares there. Um, and then my father died in 2019, sorry, <laughs> 1994. And at that time, I started really thinking about if I was ever going to reunite. Um, you know, life is uncertain. 
you never know, and maybe I should do it sooner than later. And then, as luck would have it, in 1996, um, the laws in BC changed, and I was able to gain access to my original birth certificate, which at that time I had never had. I just had sort of a um, identity card with a case number that linked to my actual birth certificate. So I was, unlike a lot of people in the States, I was never issued a false one. I was just never given access to my real one. Okay. So, I, yeah, which is um, interesting um, because I know that that whole issue is very um upsetting and concerning to a lot of people who get issued fake ones. Um, so in 96, when I was able to get hold of that, uh, my birth mother's name and hometown were listed, um, but my birth father's information was left blank because they were not married. And um, with the magic of the internet, I was able to track down four women in all of Canada <laughs> who had her full name or at least first and last name and then like maybe 40 women with the first initial and same last name and then anybody in the small town (laughs) where she was from in Newfoundland who had the same last name which apparently was all of her relatives (laughs) Uh, (laughs) and looking back I mean I, I really was trying to word my little postcard inquiry very benignly and not let the cat out of the bag I knew that um, because the adoption agency had given my parents two typewritten pages of um, non-identifying background information which I know is just like gold and tons more than lots of adoptees get whether it's true or false even to get it is cool to have some sort of fairy tale to spin out about these people who walked away from raising me Um, so uh, sorry, what was I going to tell you about You're, that you're telling me about the postcard and that the information oh, yeah. you so, put on was benign. Right, well, because the information I had about her, um, like, gosh, just thinking about it just overwhelms me with feelings of all the different people I created um, from that information and how it's still not even close to the person I met when I met my father. Um, mm. But the person that I understood her to be was a school teacher in Vancouver, or she was living in Vancouver and she was a school teacher. So I thought she'd been a school teacher there, but she hadn't. And <laughs> so when I wrote that I was looking for a school teacher from Vancouver, I thought it sounded like I could have been her student. And it just made everyone in her family really suspicious. And she wrote me, although none of the addresses I'd had for her were correct because she had been unlisted her whole life, um, she wrote me a really uh, cold letter that um, basically was about three sentences and I have it sort of memorized it said like uh, dear Carrie I understand you've been trying to reach me my private life is my own double underlined if you would like to contact me you can do so at this address and she signed her first and last thing so I thought well it wasn't an outright <laughs> dismissal. The door was still open. Um, and I sent this really crazy heartfelt letter and I happened to be planning a trip up to Newfoundland and maybe I could see her. And, you know, by some happy coincidence, that letter got returned to me. So she never got that. Um, and I did try again later. Um, and then she never got back to me. So that was... Um, heart-wrenching in lots of accounts, but one of them was my own um, mom who raised me, uh, who was my adoptive mother, but I just call my mom because <laughs> she's the one I experienced as mom. Um, Sharon would have just been so pleased to meet the woman that gave me birth and check in and, you know, sort of have a cup of tea and talk about how good Sharon had done raising me and how how great I am. That's all she really wanted to do <laughs> as a mom. And um, the rejection of me from from my birth mother was as much a slap to my mom and to see her. I don't know. It was really hard to see that pain reflected back and forth between us. Mm-hmm. And I was I was really impressed that she wanted she wanted in. Like she was she was careful not to assume that I would include her. She asked if she could meet her if I ever did and. 
I said, sure. And she was like, I mean, that was a big deal for her. My mom was pretty um, closed with her emotions. So um, I always remembered that and felt like she was really in my corner, which was huge when, um, yeah, when that continued to sting over time. And then I sort of just stuffed that down because that's uh, just, I would have to say, um, it's kind of a horror story. <laughs> And the chances are so small that it would happen to someone searching. Um, it's a really, I don't know for sure the numbers, but it's like three to 5% are rejected um, as the secondary um, thing in reunion. At least rejecting any contact at all um, happens really rarely. At least most people get at least something. And I guess I did get something, but uh, <laughs> not near what I would like. I'd have to say that's hugely unresolved for me. I I can imagine I can imagine how hurtful that was just three sentences. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, looking at it with a lot more compassion and having done a lot of reading and um, searching, the ladies over at the First Mothers Forum are. Um, <laughs> I I posted a letter there, like asking what would one of you ladies say to my to a mother who refuses contact and they were super wonderful and wrote a wonderful response so um that that was nice <laughs> you know like to get that validation like dude that sucks and we wouldn't have done that to you <laughs> um so yeah i don't mean it as a scare story but it it would have been nice i just don't know why it didn't occur to me that uh that that would be the option. I, I certainly didn't think would necessarily be super chummy. It'd be kind of awesome if the Hallmark thing happened, but I just didn't think there would be such a small <laughs> option. And and I get it that she was, um, uh, you know, sort of leapt on out of the blue and felt very cornered. So I don't know. I guess the door isn't fully closed for me. I haven't given up on that. Uh, <laughs> always keeping that wound just a little bit <laughs> open. <laughs> But um, so then I got the other weird three to five percent lottery, which is the um, percentage of birth fathers that come looking. And since she wouldn't uh, really have contact with me and I did ask if she would sort of tell me anything more about my past, which was maybe not a very direct way of asking for information about him. <laughs> um, lo and behold, uh, 12 years afterwards in 2008, my birth father... Um, actually, what happened is I got an email from the adoption agency social worker who said, um, we believe that we have a match uh, in 96. You entered your name to be contacted if any of your um, birth family, aside from your mother, wanted to find you, say, a brother or an aunt or an uncle or grandparent. Um, would you be interested in contacting, being contacted? And since it had been so long, they wanted a courtesy follow up and keep it um, anonymous, not share last names or contact information, sort of go indirect. And I, I wrote back immediately and um, we facilitated uh, a couple times back and forth through the me mediator, getting letters through. Um, but then right away went to email contacts. And then I think within a month, three weeks or a month, I drove up to meet my birth father. <laughs> And for the first time in my life, got to meet another human who belongs to the same genetic tribe, like an actual blood family member. <laughs> and since I am not a mother myself, I have, I'd never had that before. And I, I highly recommend it if you, if anyone ever gets the chance, it is terrifying and will fundamentally change your view of yourself when you get actual knowledge from where you're from but it's uh it's you know sort of like the butterfly from the cocoon you gotta you gotta be something different if you're gonna change and grow and um i i grew like immediately immediately <laughs> you know how like the grinch his heart grows three sizes at the end <laughs> i i have this really visceral image of myself of a, like a like the adoption had sort of um, cut me off from my roots in a way that strangled me and like 
collapsed one of my lungs. And when I met my birth father, it was like a lung I didn't know was collapsed, suddenly inflated with air and and, and life. And um, it was both exhilarating and wonderful and like almost like pins and needles painful to realize what was missing. Like um, it is such a intense cocktail of crazy emotions good and bad at the same time is hard to wrap your heart and head around them <laughs> and they happen so fast and um you know we gave each other a big hug and we both were on the verge of tears and I sat down on the couch and <laughs> crossed my legs and said so where the hell have you been <laughs> And by some wonderful fate, I must have mumbled he, or maybe he didn't want to hear that. <laughs> he misunderstood me to say, how the hell have you been? And we just had a normal start to the conversation. <laughs> 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 as normal as could be. And, um, you know, I spent the next three days kind of tuning in and out while he tried to um, give me as much family background information as he could, which was amazing and wonderful. But all I could do was sort of stare at his hands and the nail beds of, of his fingers and, and see how they were exactly the same shape as mine, but bigger. And I've always been a really, um, my, my mom that raised me was like 98 pounds when she got married. She could model 18th century clothing and she did. She just had this tiny little waist and wrists the size of little chicken wings and, um, when I was six years old, I tried on her wedding dress and it, it couldn't button up the sleeves because I'm just uh, <laughs> what you might describe as um, sturdy <laughs> <laughs> or or just, you know, a little more athletic. And uh, my, <laughs> my dad that raised me always sort of hoped I would be a linebacker and get a scholarship to Notre Dame. <laughs> 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 Because I was always pretty tough chasing my big brothers around. So lo and behold, I meet my birth father. And instead of the man of English descent that the Catholic Adoption Agency told me about in great detail, non-identifying detail, um, he was in fact um, a Métis, a Labrador Métis man. So he's a First Nations um, population member, um, descended from English, Scottish people on one side and Inuit, Innu people of Labrador on the other, which is a pretty big oversight to tell just the one side. Mm. <laughs> um, but it was 1970 and I get it. I've, um, I can see little white babies easier to place than a mixed race baby and that's still true today um, it's <laughs> just so complicated to get that information I can see those physical characteristics in myself when I look in the mirror now and it makes <laughs> I have videos of like uh, triple great uncles portaging canoes up the Churchill River in Labrador to their hunting grounds. They have some cool old videos from the 20s. I mean, movies that have been transcribed to video. You can find them on YouTube. If you look up the lure of the Labrador. And if you see those people working hard, like I suddenly look at my bones and my hands and I go, okay, I get, <laughs> I get what my body was designed to do and where I'm descended from. And, um, yeah, getting that information is amazing. It's amazing in a lot of ways. Um, but I will also say that um, there was a really um, Peter Pan sort of quality where you, when you don't know, that you can forever be inventing someone really cool <laughs> to be uh, your parent. And um, the hard truth of, Reunion is that you get two actual people and not two idealized people. And so I'm sure I've got habits that irritate him. And, you know, he's got his human habits that irritated me. And it was hard to mesh all those things, the gratitude to getting to meet and then realizing, oh, this is the actual person. Now all those, you know, the loss of the fairy tale, other people, 
this is what he's bringing and this is what he's bringing to the table. I'm not going to get to <laughs> wish him to be any other way now. I, this is really what I'm working with. So, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Because it's, I feel like adoption has, I mean, reunion has been really wonderful, but it, I was surprised at um, kind of the slight sadness of getting an actual specific person. <laughs> You know, like that's one of the few comforts you have if you're uh, if you grow up without knowing your background, because like my mother could have been Joni Mitchell, <laughs> could have been it could have been a lot of cool people, you know, and then you find out they're regular people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe when I was younger, I was imagining, of course, that I was some sort of princess. And um, yeah, that was not the case for me either. I don't know that I. Well, I certainly didn't know that reunion was about to happen to me. Um, and because it happened in a year where I first lost my only pregnancy in March and then lost my mom that raised me in August, I was in pretty rough shape <laughs> when my birth father found me in November all in the same year. And, but it also... It was it was rash to just jump into it, and I, I studied as much as I could along the way as it was happening. I didn't know it was about to happen, um, but I, I don't regret it. Uh, I was definitely in the mindset that life is short and you don't know what's going to happen. And I, you know, you read so many stories of people that search and search and search and don't get the chance. Um, I almost felt obligated. <laughs> um, not only to myself, but to other adoptees, like just take advantage of the chance. Who cares if you don't like what you find at the end, but who would walk away from the chance to know? Um, so yeah, it got me propelled up into my car. He's uh, my birth father, sort of a hunt and peck typist. And so having an email relationship, neither one of us much like talking on the phone. So um, email was where it was at and I just couldn't get enough information. And he was very generous and said, well, you know, I can, answer some of these questions but if you want the whole story why don't you come up and visit and so I did and we do maintain contact and I would say the relationship is pretty good now I had um I had an intense period in the beginning got really overwhelmed and I backed out of contact for two years and then um he gave me plenty of space I didn't feel uh neglected by the space <laughs> I was still pretty hot and mad for quite a while. And then when I simmered down enough, I tried again. And ironically, it was um, one of the genetic gifts he gave me that brought us back together, which is, um, weirdly, I picked up a love of playing hockey um, before I met him. When I was living up in Alaska, and for a kid from California, descended from no one, well, raised by people, none of whom played hockey or watched hockey, Really, and, and certainly my mother didn't approve of me playing. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, she, she was not thrilled. She told me quite late in, in my career, but um, in the beginning she was sweet and didn't. She kept her mouth shut, but I loved it. And it turns out that Alan played hockey from the time he was um, very young and was still quite good. I met him, he was 63 or 64 when we first met. And he was, um, we had played I guess once already together and, or twice. And then when I broke it off for two years in that time, as I was cooling down, I realized that in certain sports and dance, um, you know, you can communicate through movement in a way without using words. And since we were having trouble using words, um, I would at least try this other avenue to get back together. And I didn't need it to be anything more than playing hockey and, Thankfully, he was just sort of ready and waiting for me to cool down and, and was able to pick right back up. And um, I, I will say he's been really super generous. And he is, in fact, I don't think he'd be upset if I shared this news. But um, are you, you're familiar with Ann Fessler's book, The Girls Who Went Away? Yes. Um, well, I don't know if you know, but Ann Fessler, is, she put out the call a couple years ago to find any birth fathers that might be interested in um, being interviewed for her research on their st side of the story. And um, things came up and her research got delayed, but she just got back in touch with um, with my birth father and he's interested in speaking with her. So um, 
I just really tickled because um, they're a small percentage, those birth fathers that get bound. And um, to me, it's just, I think he's doing it because it matters to me. And um, uh, that's, that says a lot, you know, he, he's doing the best he can with what he has to. So um, Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that in a lot of ways. Okay. So that's, that's my long arching story of uh, how I got to be me. And it's funny because I, again, up until reunion didn't really, you know, when I was quite young, I was very into being adopted and how it made me special, but it just became something I quite took for granted. And even my brothers really, um, sort of forgot I was adopted. Um, but I will say I was thinking about this on the way home tonight. Mm. There was always a sense they never used it against me. But, you know, people share characteristics in in blood groups of family, you know. And there are shared characteristics of people who just live together, for sure. But there were times when I was just different from my family. And, you know, they would just remark on it. Like, you're your own kid, you know. Where did you come from? Kind of thing. And as much as you feel loved, it, it is very weird to sort of perpetually... And at the root, feel like not quite in. <laughs> and, and again, it was, I mean, not malicious. My brothers, I don't think probably ever told me, you know, well, they don't love you because you're adopted. They, they knew I was loved and they loved me too. It was never like that, but there's always just that sense. And, you know, my mom was really a tiny kind of girly woman and I'm a hockey playing granddaughter of trappers and mushers and was a musher dog musher myself like i i'm just cut from different cloth and we overlap and got each other but yeah it's uh it's weird and there's there's hard things in every family and adoption is a blessing in a lot of ways i don't mean to be you know the ungrateful adoptee but i was so surprised because i was always such a cheerleader for adoption i was it felt doubly hard to um, be upended by the re- by the reunion process because I I felt sort of betrayed by the whole institution. <laughs> I felt like I'd really only considered the upside, and then you have to when when you meet the people that walked away from you, you have to really confront that part of your history that you weren't always chosen. There was actually a part a little tiny maybe a couple weeks only but there was a portion where you weren't chosen and you know relinquishment you were you know I know some people have all of the vocabulary in adoption land is tricky and fraught with shades of fine meaning but there's no other way to get adopted unless someone lets you go so um waiting to think about that till you're 38 is probably not ideal (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and maybe that was part of what <laughs> really hit me on the head so hard about it. But, um, yeah, it, I think it was important to do. And I'm grateful I had the chance to do it and that I came out the other end, you know, with most everything intact and still moving forward and happy. So mm-hmm. so it sounds like you've done a lot of reading and research and, and that those things have helped you do some healing. Have you done any counseling or um, therapy to go through some of those issues as well? You know, it's interesting. I only just recently started going to see a lovely woman here um, who has some knowledge about adoption issues. And then I brought her a book uh, that Laura Dennis recently put out a couple years ago about adoption therapy, sort of from the perspective of adoptees and um, clinicians and therapists. Um, I read it and loved it and handed it right off to her. And um, she's been wonderful. The only other time I tried to talk to someone about it, uh, I guess I didn't really even bring it up. It was dealing with alcoholism in my family when I was in my 20s and, you know, sort of just rattled off as adopted as part of the background history, but I don't remember it being brought up at all. Mm-hmm. I I did a lot of a lot of reading at the reunion phase and found a lot of online sites too. Um, couple, two of my 
really favorite online folks besides yourself to connect with. Um, one is Rebecca Hawks, who on and off keeps a blog, um, another adoptee. Um, and and the uh, is it Lost Sisters the website? Lost Daughters. Just a, oh, sorry, Lost Daughters. Yeah, but they're my sisters. But you know, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which I guess Rebecca's part of, but um, yeah, those those sites and all the people on them, you could branch off and find a ton of great adoptee support there, mm -hmm. which was just critical for me um, in 2008, 9, and 10 as I was sort of trying on new moods and expressing my <laughs> early unfelt anger <laughs> at my do, situation. Carrie, do you feel like you hit all the different stages of reunion can you quickly remind me what is there sort of five maybe or something do you have a little list there i have a list that's from origins canada and um okay. they have fantasy so that was the imagining that we did when we were young yes. and the first yes. contact then the first meeting and the honeymoon yep. stage which i think we had all oh, yeah. already and then the, after the honeymoon, so things kind of... <laughs> <Get> down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you're like, oh, you're a real person. Okay. And then time... I'm interested. <laughs> yes. And then time out, which you said that you did. Um, oh, yes. And yes. then making adjustments. And lastly, sure. lastly, ongoing relationship. Yeah. Bingo. Oh, my gosh. That's exciting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You see, you're still a poster child. Now you're a poster child for the stages of reunion. Oh, that pleases my inner Hermione. Uh. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I would not have thought myself to be the person to pull out as violently as I did. Um, but I, I was just, I was upended and I needed to digest. And I guess that's sort of my coping pattern anyway <laughs> but it was um it was bigger than any time out I've ever had before I've never you know I'm a compliant easygoing overachieving adoptee I definitely wasn't the acting out type if you're gonna divide into two basic groups I was the Hermione type for sure <laughs> mm. um so I surprised myself with that long time out that's nice to see those all listed the time out especially <laughs> I I didn't get to time out, but I was close. <laughs> I was close. <laughs> Fingers above the plug, just twitching. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that was big of you. And I you must have learned a lot from that, too. It's man, it's it's amazing how relationships really do uh, put you right in the spot to rub up against the things you need to learn. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think you were kind of talking about before, I don't know what, what I was hearing was what I've experienced is when you're with them, whoever it is, your birth mother, your birth father, anyone that you're related to, but you've lost time with it's, it's amazing in the moment. And yet, all there is is grief. It's joy and grief all intermingled yes. and I can't I can't turn off the grief part and just enjoy the moment. Yes. It and it's and for me it was like if you envision the way um say a beach ball if you held it underwater <laughs> and just kept pushing it deep and deep and deep and then finally let it out, that's sort of what happened with my grief, I think. Um, and it just came out like a fountain and, and where was it from? I'm not sad. Why, why is this so sad? <laughs> this can't be sad. I'm super lucky. I got to meet him. He dragged me down. He's trying to make it work. Why is this sad? Um, you know, and if you get a little more perspective, you, of course it's, there's grief there. Why wouldn't there be grief there? But the popular adoption narrative is one of so much joy and fulfillment and of grief being erased that there's just not a lot of popular space to experience that and that's that just makes it harder um so yeah it's not 
I, I think, yeah, and I think it's surprising because I was walking around not feeling sad, but grief. And they're, they're such a different thing, and I didn't really realize how different they were. That you could still be really happy about something and still be just overcome with grief. Yeah. It's, it, it's that, um, do you know Lori Holden? I think it was her last name. Lava, <laughs> Lavender Les, I think is her Twitter handle. Um, she's an adoptive mom and she seems to have a, a very open mind about things. And she's really of the mindset it's both and instead of either or. Um, which is just so... Freeing, if you can say, yes, I'm grateful I was adopted and I had terrible grief. <laughs> yes, I was grateful for the reunion and I don't, it's tearing me apart and I'm becoming someone, I'm suddenly someone new. My, my sense of myself is never going to be who it was before. And that's good and it's important, but wow, I, in my case, I wasn't really ready. <laughs> I was having a hard year already. <laughs> so if you have the chance. Uh, to time it, yeah, prepare yourself. If you don't have the chance to time it and it lands in your lap, prepare yourself. <laughs> and if you walk away, that's your choice. But boy, it, there is a lot to get out of it, too. And looking back on that, the timing of it and everything, I mean, I can't imagine your um, your sorrow from your miscarriage and losing your mom because I haven't experienced either of those things yet. And... I mean, was this something that it was a distraction and I don't know. I mean, were you headed in a different direction and this changed things for you? I don't don't know. Do you ever think about that? In some ways it was lovely because it did, um, it felt like a new, I got a chance to meet my family. I didn't have to do the tricky juggling of worrying about, even though my mom said she was into it. Is she feeling threatened? And I'm sure we could have worked through it, but in a lot of ways it was, um, you know, simplified things. Mm. Um, it also compounded the grief because I really wanted my mom. She would have loved to meet him. She wanted that chance to meet her. And she could have just, if, if my birth mother had written me back his name, I was so raw already. I think, yeah. I think in some ways it, it sort of propelled me to... Um, getting right to the raw emotions right away. Like <laughs> I, I wasn't in a place to fake this reunion. I was not in a place I was going to do it to, to get real with somebody. And if you didn't have it in them, that was fine, but I needed to go and say my truth. I just didn't realize how hard that would be and how I should have ideally had a little more emotional reserve <laughs> mm. <laughs> to fall back on ideally. But you know, in some ways also it was like, well, everything comes in threes and, you know, I'm already beat down. Let's just <laughs> get right to the very basics of who I am and build up from there. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing all that. That is a lot of big, big information. <laughs> it's a big story. So Carrie, I'd love to hear if you have any recommended resources for our listeners. And I have two books actually I'd love to share with you and if you're okay with that I'll go first you mentioned Lost Daughters earlier this is uh, these are two books from one of the Lost Daughters Deanna Schroes who I know that you're familiar with and she wrote her memoir Worthy to be Found and part two is Restored and she shares about finding her birth mother, their reunion relationships, their ups and downs, and then just the great grief from her birth mother withholding her birth father's name from her. And I, I just really love Deanna's heart, and she has a wonderful blog called Adoptee Restoration, and her great heart is for adoptees to be restored and so her story is really powerful and I just I feel so badly that she's still searching for her dad and her mom had that information and she wouldn't give it to her so they're really both really well written books and I really recommend them I have not read them although I have spent tons of hours over on Deanna's um, blog and 
have oh, couldn't agree more. It's such a wonderful voice and heart and um, empathetic ear. My couple um, that I would recommend are reunion specific and um, the author is Evelyn Robinson. And she's an Australian woman, and I found her books on Amazon. Um, and I believe the one that I read, the reunion one is not in my hand, but it was um, Adoption, Reunion, The Agony, Agony or Ecstasy? It's a little subtitle. And um, it really resonated with me as I was just sort of struggling uh, just past the honeymoon phase. And um, being a not, not being an American, the perspective was really refreshing. Um, because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of room in the States for there to be anything but the Hallmark happy narrative. And her book, um, just the title gave me room to <laughs> have my reunion be any way that it was. And it could be both. And um, she has some other books as well um, that I'd recommend checking out. Um, okay, good. Reading. And I can, I'll put a link to it in our, in our show notes so that uh, people can find it. Yay. Yeah, so if our listeners want to connect with you, Carrie, where can they find you online? Um, my business is to make hats, uh, warm woolen hats that I, I learned to make when I was living up in Alaska. And, you know, come to find out um, all my women ancestors were making warm woolly clothing going way back in Labrador. So that's fun to find out. But my uh, initials are CCM and... And then hats, H A T S. So CCM hats is my handle at Twitter and my Etsy shop for my hats. And I think my Facebook page probably has that and Google and YouTube <laughs> and wherever else. That was generally what I tried to pick. Oh, actually, my Twitter handle isn't that because someone in Germany had that. So my Twitter handle is CCM felt hats. Okay, well, so. I will put a link to that up as well. And I can attest that Carrie's hats are so beautiful. I, <laughs> I, I love your tweets about how you make them. And they're so colorful. And whenever you post a picture of your... Um, I don't know what you call it, your shop, your, your workshop, the, the studio, the yeah. studio. Thank you. The hats on the wall. Just, this is just beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I do love um, connecting with other adoptees and other people connected with adoption. It has been very, um, it's just really added a whole lot to my life to meet people like yourself and the lost daughters um, online and have a community that I never had growing up. So thank you for the chance to get to talk. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you being so vulnerable and authentic with us. That <laughs> is, it's not, it's, it's rare to be able to, to hear someone's story in this depth. So thank you very much. Thank you for asking. Didn't Carrie have some beautiful metaphors? If you have some more questions for her, or would just like to thank her for sharing with us, you can connect with her on Twitter at CCM Felt Hats. To share your story or to ask us a question, visit our website, adoptezon.com. You can send us an email or you can record a short voicemail that we could feature on an upcoming show. You can also find us on Twitter or Instagram at adoptezon. Today, would you share our show with your adoptee network? We would be thrilled to have your support. Thanks for listening. Let's talk again soon.